Dr. Irving Ladosky Berger, and I want to say uh, a few words about him, but I want to sort of set this up a little bit first. Uh, some of you around the table know that uh, for the past 22 months or so, we've been talking about the future of the Annenberg School in terms of three I's, impact, internationalization, and innovation. And over the course of 22 months, we have, I think, kind of centered on the idea that innovation is really core to what we want to do here at the Annenberg School. Um, and so there is a series that we've been undertaking here at the school, inviting people, experts on innovation, uh, to give talks in this room. The Annenberg School has great strengths and great weaknesses. Let me rephrase that. <laughs> the Annenberg School has great strengths and a few small weaknesses. <laughs> The great strengths are that we are really big, and we're really well known, and we have pretty decent resources. We got a great brand. Now, what's the bad news about the Annenberg School in a period of innovation? It's a question. It's a test question. Mm -hmm. Professor Toll. Oh, right. Well, we need more space. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Everything is local. Everything is local. We're big, we're well branded, and we're well resourced. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. Because in the time of great change, when the environment is changing quickly, how do big institutions turn on a dime to catch up, not just catch up with the environment, but to anticipate what's going to happen, and then to be able to lead those changes. Well, there's probably one organization in the world that has the best reputation for having been really big, very well branded, and very well resourced. And that organization is IBM. And yet IBM reached a point in its, uh, in its organizational life where it reached a crisis, and in relatively short amount of time, it turned on a dime, or actually turned on several billions of dollars worth of dimes, <laughs> and came out even stronger than, than when it went into the crisis. So uh, I don't want to draw an absolute parallel between these two <laughs> institutions, uh, but I, I will leave you to uh, make your own judgment. But uh, the person who was significantly responsible for the change of thinking inside IBM to reorient their strategy was the person who is our first innovator in residence here at the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism. Um, we all have various claims to fame. Let me just point to two very interesting things about uh, Irving's uh, background or his status. Um, I've never met anybody in person who was cited multiple times in a Harvard business in Harvard Business Review cases. So Irving fits that uh, that description. Uh, if you look at the classic works by the Harvard Business Review, Harvard Business School, and the, the cases that they prepare, you will see that our guest is cited there. Also in the work um, by uh, Lou Gertzner, who was the uh, CEO of IBM at the time. He cites our guest as someone who is absolutely essential in making the world's, um, uh, one of the world's largest organizations change because he was responsible for internet strategy at a time when the internet was still a new thing and its real power had not yet been recognized. So during his 37 year career with IBM, Irving was responsible for identifying and capturing and capitalizing on these uh, kinds of technologies. Um, he led a number of, uh, of company-wide initiatives, such as the uh, Linux initiative, grid computing, and in 2002, IBM's emphasis on uh, business, uh, demand business initiative and the e-business initiative, e-commerce initiative. His list of accomplishments is too long, but I'm going to cite a couple of them, uh, too long to mention. Just a few strategic advisor to Citigroup. I think he still occupies that position. Visiting lecturer at uh, MIT Sloan School of Management and Engineering Systems Division. 
senior fellow at the Levin Institute of the State University of New York, member of BP's Technology Advisory Council. Uh, I could go on and on. I'll just cite founding member of Computer Sciences and Telecommunications Board of the National Research Council. Um, very, very interesting, varied background moving across a variety of different silos that make up the modern political economy. Um, I guess my, my last note I'll say is Irving uh, was not originally is not originally from California. Uh, he was born in Cuba and came to the United States at the age of 15. Um, and he it says that he is most proud of being named 2001 Hispanic Engineer of the Year. Uh, along the way to doing these other things, I think he picked up a master's and a PhD in physics from some university called the University of Chicago, I think. So uh, this is a man of many parts and many accomplishments. Uh, he'll talk for a bit, lead us in some very interesting conversation, um, and then we will have um, a response from two of our colleagues, and I'll introduce them um, after Irving finishes. So it gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce our innovator in residence, Irving Wadowski. Thank you. Let me present. We don't need to use the microphone, no, right? The microphone is fine. Yes. Well, first of all, when Dean Wilson uh, contacted me, would I want to spend a week at the Annenberg School as innovator in residence? Uh, I thought he was going to then say, I thought it would be like, you know, I don't know, the Yankees saying, would you like to come to a fantasy baseball camp? <laughs> <laughs> and, and by the way, here is the bill. <laughs> so it'll be a lot of fun. You'll hang out with good people, but it won't be uh, uh, cheap. And, uh, and you know, I, I didn't ask you how much do I have to pay <laughs> to come to the fantasy camp. But that's how I felt. Wow, I get to come to the Annenberg School and spend a week here. That is a real treat. Mm -hmm. So let me talk about innovation. And, and the point of view I want to take uh, <coughs> is very much the whole notion of innovation in the marketplace. That's the point of view I want to take. And, and I, I will do that first by talking about things I know quite a bit about, which is in IBM. But then um, I will put on my almost blogger hat. I, I've, I've been doing a blog since 2005. <coughs> and uh, the thing about blogging that I love the most is that I can write a blog about whatever the hell I feel like. <laughs> now, nobody may read it, <laughs> but I get to write about whatever I feel like. And, if, and whether I know something about the subject or not, <laughs> it's immaterial. <laughs> it's a blog. It's not a paper or it's not a conference. And so the second part of what I do will be more in the form of an oral blog. In, in the mid-80s, IBM was the most profitable company in the world. In absolute terms, it made more profit than any other company. It was incredibly respected. And then there was a major technology transition that almost killed IBM when microprocessors showed up, because you could now build computers based on those microprocessors that were not quite as good in many things as the mainframe, but much, much less expensive. So IBM's customers started to build, to buy those servers and its client server computing. And, and IBM's mainframe business started to lose share. And it started to lose the uh, profit margin. <coughs> IBM, in, in its heyday, it had such a big share of the market 
it could set the price, whatever it wanted it to be. And you know, if you can set the price whatever you wanted it to be, <laughs> it, you won't set a cheap price. You, you, you live very nicely. But once you get competition, the market sets the price. <laughs> and boy, the market is a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and all of a sudden, the profit margins uh, eroded quite a bit. And we almost died. And then we had the good fortune, we, we got a new CEO. Remember, IBM was very close. I hope that in your transformation, you never have to come close to what happened to us, because we almost ran out of cash. It got that bad. IBM was really uh, losing money like crazy. And Lou Gerstner came in, and he turned out to be a superb CEO but absolutely superb. He's probably one of the top best strategies I've ever met in my life. And, and we first uh, had to stabilize the company, I mean, uh, sort of get it out of the emergency room. And that took a while. And then once that happened, it came time to rebuild IBM, and in particularly, totally changed the culture from a very inward-looking company where, you know, it was so powerful and did things so well that it's like le tasse et moi, you know? Why, why look anywhere else when we are so much better than anybody else? People didn't quite say that aloud, and if you stop them, and you say, are you that arrogant? They say, of course not. <laughs> we, we like people, but you know, when, when, you, when you think you are at the top of the world, you don't tend to listen. And that's the culture that almost killed IBM, because while we were protecting our castle, the barbarians were gathering outside, and they were having a ball. <laughs> and eventually, the barbarians won. And part of the major change in culture that Lou had to institute is, you know, why don't we hang out with the barbarians? <laughs> and why don't you do two things? First, invite them to the castle, and then go out there where they are, and we'll be a far better company for doing that. And he writes in his book that, he didn't quite use this language, but close, that at the time IBM was ready to now move into the future, we got like a gift from the gods. The same gods that punished us for our hubris before said almost, okay, Lou, here is the internet. It is perfect for the kind of cultural transformation you need because you didn't invent it, it's in the marketplace, it's being done by all these barbarians, whatever. Don't screw it up, you get one more chance. And if you screw it up, you're toast. And boy, did we embrace it. It's like, this was like a lifeboat and, and we did a very good job in then figuring out how the internet could become very relevant to business, to the kinds of things IBM did. And, we, and then we loved it. We said, oh, God, we should have done this a long time ago. So when you know, the gods gave us more gifts, Linux and open source, they were there. We'll go out. Virtual worlds, we'll go out there. So IBM just totally shifted in recognizing that the, the phone was in the marketplace, but this is very important to everything I want to talk about. To be part of that phone, you need to be brave enough to get out into the marketplace. If you stay in your castle, in your labs, in your university, and you don't go out there, that's not where the game is played. So you have to go out there. Now, when, 
Lou also writes that when he got to IBM and he looked at the strategies that IBM people had put together, absolutely everything that happened had been predicted, everything. In fact, the very technologies that almost killed IBM, the PC, have you heard of the IBM PC? <laughs> so here we are, we do the IBM PC, and then we let others use it to almost kill us. There is something called risk microprocessors, reduce instruction set computers, which companies like Sun and HP used to build powerful Unix workstations. IBM invented risk microprocessors, just that we let others take it to market, but we invented it. And so when Lou got to IBM, remember, here we are, April of 93, and we, we, we were really near death. And the, one of the first places he went to visit was IBM Research Labs. IBM has Yorktown Heights, is Thomas J. Watson Research Center is IBM's largest research lab. Now we have like eight to 10 research labs around the world, including Beijing, Delhi, Haifa, Zurich, and a few other places, Alma then, California. And, you know, I wasn't in IBM research then. I had spent 15 years in IBM research, but I had already moved on to our development organizations. People were afraid Lou was coming to close IBM research. Much as, you know, look at the Bell Labs. Bell Labs used to be the jewel of jewels of labs, and it's basically gone. We thought he was going to close it. Well, Lou came out of research and said, what you guys do is fabulous. This is, this is about, it's like me coming to USC, you know. This is fabulous, but there's only one problem. Get the hell out into the marketplace because the technologies in the lab are not interesting. So go hang out with customers. Go show them your technologies. Go do projects with them. And that really changed drastically the culture of our whole IBM research labs. And IBM may be one of the few private sector companies that continues to have major research labs. And the reason IBM has been able to afford that is because IBM research is viewed as such a critical part of IBM. And let's say whenever the salespeople have you know, a massive new problem that they have no idea what to do with clients, they just go to, to the research labs and say, let's do a first of a kind, whether it's, I don't know, congestion pricing in, in Sweden. I mean, who the hell knows how to design a system that does that effectively? Well, so you bring that in, and so that has worked very well. But key lesson was keep inventing stuff but you have to change your ways and move from the research labs to the marketplace. So now let me move to the blog part of my, my talk. And by the blog part, let me remind you, it means if you think I sound like I don't know what I'm talking about, it's just a blog. <laughs> so don't worry about it. So, I've been, uh, you know, with this newfound freedom that in blocks I can do whatever I want to. One of the things I've been very interested is this whole notion of, let me call it Silicon Valley envy. That it's a little bit, you don't hear it as much today, but for quite a while, every other region in the world had Silicon Valley or Silicon Gulch, I think Silicon Gulch was in Scotland, and Silicon Alley, where was Silicon Alley? In New York, right, in 
about New York and Silicon this and Silicon that. And just about all of them were total failures. They weren't able to recreate that. And if you look at the US, there are two major regions that everybody agrees are incredible centers of what I would call entrepreneurial innovation. One of them is Silicon Valley, and it's the region around Stanford and Berkeley. Those are the sort of two centers. The other one is the Boston area, and it's the region around MIT. Everybody pretty much agrees that th th this two areas do a superb job in entrepreneurialism. They have lots of VCs. You know, other places, by the way, Israel has incredible entrepreneurialism as well. In the case of Israel, I believe it's probably centered around the Technion in Haifa. I suspect that. And other places, I mean, Austin does pretty good because of UT Austin. Pittsburgh with CMU does okay. I mean, Pittsburgh a little bit smaller, but I started to ask myself, what is it about this region, so in Silicon Valley and the Boston area, that have made them so successful, <coughs> and why is it so difficult to recreate? And there were a few things that you could tell were very critical. In fact, um, I read this blog that was that sort of had the most interesting answer here that said, if you want to be Silicon Valley, and, and they also meant the Boston area here, you need two kinds of people. You need rich people and you need nerds. <laughs> and what it said is, the, but you need a certain kind of rich person. You need rich people who like to hang out with the nerds, who probably were nerds themselves once upon a time, and who not only have money to invest, but they will get involved in the companies they invested, they will have been in the board. So they are very hands-on rich people. By the way, this was very important because I live in the New York area, and one of the questions I, I continue to ask myself is, why hasn't that quite happened in New York? And one of the things I'm convinced, in New York, our rich people only hang out with each other, and they have, <laughs> you know, they have all kinds of benefits in the temple of the Endur at the <laughs> Metropolitan. <laughs> but if you look at them, they are all these rich people, and they're all hanging out with each other. So that's why New York, I think, we can talk about that also, has not been a major innovation center probably since the since Mad Men days. Sort of, I think <laughs> Mad Men. I'm being very serious now, but but sort of from a more from a more uh, the reality, the organization man. William, I don't know if you're familiar, William White's famous yeah. book, that was about the transition of New York from entrepreneurial capitalism to the kind of corporate capitalism that Mad Men so nicely depicts, so, <laughs> so, so well depicts. And, and then the nerds are really hungry people. This, you know, they really, they have ideas, but it's not just that they, I mean, it's it, it sort of the, their view of what you need is people who have ideas, but if you say, well, write a paper, and they look at you, why? <laughs> <laughs> because what they want to do is build something. They have ideas to build something, start a business, go to the marketplace, and maybe become one of these rich people but they are driven by the idea. And some make it very big, others do not. But, but it's okay, they, are, they just are really hungry to get things done. And, you know, I don't know Stanford as well, though I've spent a lot of time in, in D1, 
the area. But MIT I know very well now because I've been for about four years a visiting professor. It's in the culture of the place. I mean, in MIT, people have ideas and they want to prototype, build, figure out how to get it out there. And it's just part of the culture. And, and it's a, you know, my own alma mater, the University of Chicago, it's a great school, but, but it's a great school for thinking and writing papers and doing, it's a great classic lab school. It's, it's great, there's nothing against that. It's just different from what we're talking about. It's not at all an entrepreneurial school. And I think most Ivy League schools are more like Chicago. I mean, at Harvard, when we're talking, there, let's say, you show up there and you know you're going to be president of the US, <laughs> be the president of a company, you know, maybe become the dean. You know, you, you know that's out there for you, but I don't know if people think so much about getting an idea and doing something with it. And, uh, and so, so I became convinced. So if you really want to be a center of entrepreneurial innovation, then you need smart people to have ideas, but we're full of those. Our great universities have it. But the sort of the je ne sais quoi you need to add is this hunger to get it to the marketplace. That's what you need to add. And so I got here yesterday, and you know I went to the Stevens Institute. I don't know if Z is here. I don't see her. And you know we talked a lot about the things that are going on with innovation, and you know, and I was asking myself, well, but, but. If you're going to do innovation, what are you going to innovate in? You know, it's very important because uh, you cannot innovate in everything. You know, Silicon Valley and you know MIT and Stanford, MIT, Berkeley, this thing, and, Sta and uh, Stanford, uh, Berkeley, and MIT are engineering schools and they are science schools. Now there's a lot with biology. So the bulk of what they do is very <coughs> technology-based innovation. That's what they are. They do these great technology-based things. And, and then <coughs> the ecosystem around them to help them start companies <coughs> around those technologies. By the way, they've been built over decades. I mean, the, the, I mean, if you go back in Silicon Valley, at least since the 1970s, and Fairchild Semiconductors, and Intel, and Varian, and HP, <coughs> and so on, and then all the others. And in the MIT area, there is this whole, you know, digital computers that, you know, died. Uh, they died around the time IBM should have died, except we were able to pull through, and they weren't. Uh, their whole, you know, lots and lots of things around Route 128 that have been there for at least since the 1970s. So, so you need to decide what, if you're going to do innovation in the university, what are you really good at? And what is there an ecosystem around you that can help you? Those two are critical. And what is clear is, for example, if somebody said, well, we want to be just like MIT. I don't mean any disrespect. It's just hard for USC to be the world-class engineering school MIT is. It's just difficult. I'm not saying you couldn't do it. it may take 40 years. Uh, maybe Caltech. I mean, Caltech is inf really, really good. It's just probably far smaller. Plus, also, I don't know if the LA area has the kind of engineering culture that you find in Silicon Valley and so on. I know it has manufacturing, it used to have big Air Force things, but you don't associate LA with that. And, and as I was thinking, I said, okay, so here I am in the Annenberg School of Communications. And, and you know, so what, what, 
what you know, and, and the view you have of communications is media and social networking, and lots and lots of stuff that is incredibly hot. I think there is, in my opinion, there are few areas hotter than technology-based communication. And I'm talking about technology-based communication, <coughs> not because it's the only kind, but because I'm a technology. So that's the part I feel most comfortable with. And then if you look out at the LA area, boy, this, if this is not the sort of media center of the world, uh, <coughs> you know, lots of communications, visual stuff, game players, uh, if, if it's not the top one, I don't know who can compete. New York doesn't have the movies and the production stuff. Maybe in journalism it could lay claim to it. So, so I kept asking myself, gee, why don't you put those two together? Because that's what, what it, it feels like. <coughs> And then as I was talking to people yesterday, I met a few people, it was clear to me the projects you're, that, that I saw were fascinating. And, and then some graduate students I met, some of them were telling about these projects with using fe cell phones to help working class poor immigrants tell their stories. Uh, and then one after another, and the one answer I didn't get to my question was, are you building a prototype? Are you trying this out to do that? And I, I didn't get that answer. That, well, in other words, I didn't get the answer, well, of course. What the hell? In fact, I was talking to Henry Jenkins, whom I knew at MIT. And he agreed with me. In MIT, they had the idea they'd be building the damn thing. <laughs> and he said in his view, and I totally agree, they will build it before they know what the hell they are building. <laughs> so they, they, they just like to build things, and then they will ask questions later. <laughs> and, and you know, many of these things they build, then they keep improving. <coughs> and of course, to, to be able to get things to market, and getting things to market is, doesn't mean necessarily you start a company. That's one of the routes to market, but it may be you work with an existing company that uses it, you, you work with an NGO, you work with government, but you need something, you know, you need to bring them. You say, I'm working on water, you need to bring this. And, and, and now everybody sees what you're talking about, and, and so building things is very important if you want to take it to the marketplace. And, and so I saw here two of three critical ingredients. I saw lots of ideas, and in fact, I've been asking people, are you the top school in technology-based communications? And one or two, I think you said yes. Absolutely. Yeah, I think, I think you said yes. Uh, other people have been a little more modest. They said <laughs> they are not sure, but then when I say who else, they don't have an answer. So they are, it's like saying, well, I, I'm, are you the prettiest person? And I said, well, I'm not sure. Who else is prettier? I don't know. <laughs> that, that is, uh, yeah, humility is overrated. Humility is <laughs> overrated, but, but Patricia, absolutely. So <laughs> that's where are the best. So you have these things, and there are all these ideas from the faculty, and you were telling me about ICTs doing all this stuff, and I met with Henry and his team here, and they're doing all kinds of things in all kinds of areas, and the students are doing it, and the LA area seems ripe for the things you're doing. I mean, it's not as if the industries around here are feeling comfortable. <coughs> they are all, I mean, they're all close to, I mean, they're, they're all, if they really are honest with themselves, wondering, will they die? Yeah, mm -hmm. Irving, the only thing that's missing from your ecosystem that you talked about in Silicon Valley and, and, and Massachusetts is that the money in LA 
in the media system is held by a few big companies that are actually resistant okay, to technological communication mm. because they think it will, they use the word cannibalize their existing business. So we don't have like a venture system. No, no, I, un I understand totally. And I think it's true in New York by and large. In fact, one of the reasons uh, I, I'm part of the Levin Institute in New York, which is part of SUNY, gorgeous brownstone on 55th and Park. <laughs> Uh, it's a very nice address. <laughs> uh, in fact, I remember we were sort of saying, okay, so where are the areas in New York we need to do stuff? And we started asking these questions, let's say in the fall of 07. And at the time we said, well, finance, they are in such good shape, they won't want to talk to us. I'm serious. Because in 07, they hadn't gone off the cliff yet. But New York is in the same way that, and I think it's probably like here, and I think of it more and more. I got this, uh, this word I'm about to use from The Economist. They had a great article on this, which is the notion of entrepreneurial capitalism. And entrepreneurial capitalism is all about creating new things. And I bet you, if you look at you know, Samuel Goldwyn and Meyer and all the people who created the movie industry and then Bill Paley and I don't know, who created RCA? Was it Sarno? Sarno. 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 I mean, those guys were incredible entrepreneurs. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all the people in New York who created the ad agencies, Ogilvy, mm -hmm. I mean, they were real entrepreneurs because what, when they created this stuff, they didn't exist. Those industries didn't exist. And then, in many parts of the world, but maybe especially in the big cities, New York, LA, London, they went corporate. They really, you know, and that's why William White wrote The Organization Man. And, and I wrote a blog about this not long ago, and I, I was researching The Organization Man. And, and you know, there were lines in his book that Instead of, they didn't want individuals to be creative because they wouldn't <coughs> fit the organization. <coughs> That's what they were. And, and I think, again, I, I like Mad Men a lot. Uh, I don't know how many of you Love have it. seen <coughs> that. Uh, the one you thing know. that, that boy, Mad Men, if you ever want to show <laughs> girls why we had the feminist revolution. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, I think Mad Men is about a year away from that. You can see, yeah. just show them Mad Men and they will be shocked. They will really, it, it, that, that, is, that is really incredible. Uh, so the question is, you have these things and it's how do you, how do you add this third dimension which is build the stuff you have and figure out how to get it out there, whether the big companies like it or not. Because they don't have to like it, but there must be companies in LA that would like to kill them. I'm serious, and that's all you need, is hungry people that want to kill those companies. We were talking before, and one of the examples I've used of why I don't think, you know, New York, they said, were the media capital of the world. They say that. Then I asked them, how come Netflix came out of Silicon Valley? I mean, if you are the media goddamn capital of the world, <laughs> I would have expected you to have invented Netflix. And they said, well, I don't know, it's a technology company. <laughs> well, everything is a technology company. Right. So if you're going to say we will only innovate when there are no technologies, <laughs> it, it, the game is over. And, and I could ask the same question. Why wouldn't, in, why was companies like Netflix? Now, there may be a lot of things like that, and maybe all they are waiting is somebody to take charge, sort of, and, and the somebody, uh, look at the examples of Silicon Valley and, and Boston, it has to be a university. You, you cannot be 
a major entrepreneurial area without a major university. It, it, you, I don't know any place that has done that, so maybe they are waiting for you. <laughs> maybe. Well, that's a good segue, and I hope that our two respondents will agree in the affirmative. <laughs> but uh, I, I will leave that up to them. We have, uh, first of all, I, I, I want to thank Irving for, for that very, very <laughs> Um, and in response, we have uh, uh, two uh, people who are wonderfully positioned to respond to this. Professor Arv Arvind uh, Bambri from the Business School. Uh, I'm going to ask him to go first. He's an expert in corporate leadership. He teaches that here at, uh, at our Business School, uh, looking at the relationship between CEOs, the way they restructure organizations, uh, and their leadership style, organizational change, and then the performance that comes out at the other end. Then I'm going to ask uh, Patty Riley, who is a professor here at the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism, and works on similar issues of leadership and organizational change and organizational culture. How does one put communication at the center of organizations? Uh, she was also director of the uh, communication school and actually has a PhD in communications, but an undergraduate degree in biostatistics. Yeah. How's that for? I'm one of those geeks. <laughs> <laughs> I've been working hard on making it more, you know, sort of socially acceptable. <laughs> so why don't I ask uh, Professor Bombry to uh, respond, and then I'll ask uh, uh, Professor uh, Riley. First, uh, a quick aside. <clears throat> Irving was very modest when he talks about his blog. Uh, if you haven't been to his blog, you should. Uh, it is one of the the best written, researched, referenced blogs around. And it's, it's just great. Uh, when he writes about smart cities, you know, he's got references. He, he wrote some really interesting thing on scalable efficiency and learning, and that takes you into uh, a big shift research project. So, you know, so uh, Irving, uh, thank you for that blog, because it's been extremely helpful. Um, the first question that I have for you is, when Lou Gerstner came into IBM, okay, you'd already been at IBM for about 20 years, right? 20 plus years. So you were an IBM veteran. Okay. Um, and IBM- I have been in IBM, let's see, from 19, yeah, actually yeah, 20, 23 years. Three years. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, and IBM had this process of <coughs> checks and balances that made it almost impossible to do anything. Right. Uh, not just anything different, but anything. Uh, it, it was called the contention system. Exactly, the non-concurrence and the contention right. system. I actually wrote a case study on Lou Branscom and the non-concurrence uh, system. Uh, and when Lou Gerstner appointed you, uh, you know, he said something like, Irving was the ideal executive to take on this task. Okay. He had rock solid technical credentials, but he also had the ability in his endearing Cuban accent <laughs> to translate very complex technologies into understandable ideas that got people excited, and, and so on and so forth. But you were an IBM veteran. So what you had to do was to behave in a style that was very different from the IBM tradition not just individually, but also to help the company unlearn practices that were really, really deeply entrenched. So the, I'm wondering, first of all, if you can comment a little bit about your own style and what yeah. enabled you to be a part of that culture and yet step outside, yeah. and then to make that whole cultural shift happen. Well, I, I, here is what I think, that IBM, had two major traditions. The one that sort of became most famous or infamous was the sales culture. And IBM was sort of this great sales culture. And that's the one that, you know, white shirts and, and all this stuff. And, and it, it was wonderful. It did all this great stuff. But that's the one, and the previous CEO, John Akers, came from the sales culture. Pretty much all the people who ran IBM had come from the sales culture. And 
And the sales culture was based on push things into the marketplace. And you can only do that uh, if the things you are pushing are so new that the <coughs> marketplace is just going to take anything you get there. But IBM had another culture that the sales culture change, had to change radically, and it did. The other culture was also very strong, and in my opinion, saved IBM, and that's the research culture. IBM had, for a long time, a superb technical culture in its research and development labs. And remember, that's my world. So I came, I was never a salesman. I mean, that's just not what I am at all. But I spent 15 years in Yorktown in our research labs. And then if you look at the things, I became a manager and so on. But if you look at the things I led, it's like super computing <coughs> and the internet. You know, they're very technology-oriented things. And, and the research culture is so collaborative to begin with. How do you do things in physics if not working with the physics community? How do you do things in computer sciences? <coughs> so the culture of, a res of research was very collaborative because it's always been. That, that's what you all do is do that. And what was new, what changed, is how do we now apply that collaborative style, not just to research, but to everything. And I think that's the huge change that happened. Now, as far as me, I didn't know any better. You know, I, that was, that's probably why I went into physics, and that's probably why I went into research, and that's why I did the things I did. And what happened is almost, and I, I, don't, I mean this, <coughs> may sound arrogant, but I don't mean it. It's like the complexity of the world caught up with what we were good at. <laughs> that is, the internet became so goddamn complicated. I, mean, I don't mean the internet became complicated. The kinds of things you can build with the internet <coughs> that you needed the kinds of things we do a lot of in the research world. We keep talking to ourselves because in the talking, that's to help us understand. I mean, I write the blog to help me understand what I'm thinking about. And, and we also know that to, I mean, when you write papers or go to conferences, you're marketing your ideas to your colleagues. So you have to do what I did that, that, that is the, what Lou wrote in this thing. You have to go around and convince your colleagues to work with you, which is very different from the more classic hierarchical culture. I mean, you see Mad Men, you know, IBM was like that also. IBM was much nicer to women. But, <laughs> but so you, know, say. you know, the IBM always, always was really good that uh, within the company, people tried to kill each other. There was this, this battle within the company to go off the hierarchy. And you know, in the research things, I mean, of course you compete, but it's in a different sense. So I think that's why, uh, that, that's what enabled me to do that is my research roots. Well, let me ask uh, Patty if she would, because uh, I know you, you've, research these issues in a variety of different kinds of organizations, not only domestic organizations, but international organizations with the UN, and not only in the media, but other service sectors as well. So I wonder if you could comment on that and uh, sure. address that. I, I wanted to um, echo something that Arvin said. One of the things that's wonderful about Irving's blog is the links. And that's one of the things that, you know, those of us in Annenberg are really um, very, very focused on, is how you get the networks going, how do you leverage all of the knowledge in different areas. And I also wanted, you know, um, 
just to say thank you just for all that IBM has done for education over the years. I know that a number of the big research projects um, that I've run over the years were actually paid for by IBM's Institute of Knowledge Management. Mm. And so, you know, I'm glad full, you said that. Full, sort of full disclosure here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, just one of those things. The, I think the comparison with MIT is very, very interesting. I mean, if you look at media organizations that are really successful over time, both for being able to leverage the creative parts of what they do, that, that part of innovation, but also figure out how to manage the money and how to take it to the streets. <coughs> If you look at places like Pixar, which you know I like to look at because they're one of those prime examples of an organization where they communicate the culture really clearly inside, but externally, the leadership is made up of different people who have different skill sets. And so you're not trying to find one of these places where if you don't have you know uh, both Irving and Lou Gessner in the same organization, you at least know you need to have people sort of like them. And so you've got the ability to kind of take these leaders and move them in ways that leverage what it is that they do best. And so I think that, that that's really important. What MIT has done, you know, that we can learn from is they not only create the knowledge, which of course you have to do if you're going to be able to be um, competitive in the academic world, and they recruit the best <coughs> faculty and the best students and that's what this consortium of sort of arts and communication related schools at USC have tried to do. I mean our, our president is you know retiring and so he's been talking about you know some of the things that he thinks are best about USC and he puts the, uh, the School of Cinematic Arts and Annenberg and the Music School, the Art School, Architecture, all of those sorts of schools together and says that this is the best complex of its sort probably in the world, right? And location, of course, around Hollywood is really important. But we've been able to do that to a degree but perhaps not the as much of the prototyping and all of that. And so I agree completely with that. And so the question is, what exactly are all of the analogs, right? <coughs> what's the what's the analogy for um, for those of us in thought leadership, for those of us who don't have quite so many um, material products? How do we make sure that you know we do more than just um, consult, you know, to the industry. Uh, the projects that we're working on right now, a lot of them have really critical ap applications to them. You know, we've got a big project looking at creativity in news organizations and how they can be entrepreneurial because, you know, the business model uh, issues, of course, have been, you know, talked about for several years now. And so one of the key things that'll be interesting, you know, after you've spent a week here, <coughs> is that if you can help us think more about how one takes that to the streets. No, no, so. but let, let's pick an example. So just before coming here, we were talking about virtual worlds and things like that. And I heard about this incredible project to have a more immersive journalistic experience. So if you, right, if you want to take me to Iraq, you know, I'll immerse myself in Iraq. And now, the, but the question then is, okay, so you go to a certain point, but, I, but it would be really good to see a prototype of that. And it doesn't have to be a great prototype, it can be as crude initially as possible, but it would be good to build it. And as we were talking, the talent to build prototypes like that is all over LA. I mean, even if the cinematic school and the engineers tell you to go to hell, uh, it doesn't matter. I'm not saying they do. They may be, they say, oh, I'd love nothing more than to build prototypes for the Annenberg School, but the talent is around. Because, and then you start doing the market experiment. By market experiments, I don't mean financial market. So, uh, is this appealing? Do people like it? Because it's, 
you know, I think that this is all about design. So you have to keep designing the experience until you get it right, or, or some student gets it right. By the way, here is something very important that IBM does a lot. And cool. As you are experimenting, when you get good ideas, get the IP. Because, no, no, because somebody else may actually do a better job in the eventual thing, but at least if you get intellectual property, that's how you also share in whatever you do. And even if you decide, no, I want to give it away, you can only give away what you own. <laughs> no, this is very important. IBM, you may know, has more patents than almost anybody else. The vast majority are defensive in purposes, you know, to make sure that somebody else doesn't get a patent in an idea and then blocks us from doing something. And more and more, for example, when Linux was being attacked by an unnamed company in the <laughs> Seattle area, everybody knew that the Linux community had some very good supporters with a ton of patents. And boy, if that community starts going through your code, they'll find something that you are doing that is infringing, guaranteed. So, so it, it just gets a kind of just bluster instead of actually suing anybody. But I, that was a very good example of beginning to build an experiment and take it to the next level. or. You know, I don't know where this cell phone project is, but it sounds incredibly exciting. And, and it's such a good example of, we were talking before, of reverse innovation where, okay, so if people use Facebook in Beverly Hills, that's not that interesting. But if you are giving poorer people a way to tell the stories and share it through the cell phones, that is transformational. Uh, Professor uh, Overholzer may want to address that issue because she's uh, the leader of our, of our journalism school and is very much involved in all of these experiments. So, Geneva, do you want to? Thank you. Thank you, Ernie. Uh, is this, what you're saying is so heartening, and I know all of us are just eating it up. I think partly because we do feel that we're sort of on the cusp of that. Uh, you know, having journalism and communications, having so many interesting <coughs> people doing so many interesting things. I mean, when I asked Nani to, when we asked Nani to join us in, in, as a senior scholar doing this research, it was precisely with this in mind that we have got to take the sort of urgency about information in the public interest and start doing something about it. Not just, I mean, it's great to be training students in this, but, you know, there's a, an urgent need for us to help feed this situation. Mobile voice is another great idea. To a degree, I think we're taking some of it and putting it on the streets. I mean, Mobile Voices is collaborating with Intersections, a South Los Angeles reporting project to, you know, sort of put things on the street. But in terms of building, this sort of gets back to Patty's question. I mean, we haven't, strictly speaking, always been about building, although I completely accept the notion that part of what we need to do is think about how we're going to actually extend the reach of this by putting practical things out there. What, you know, to me, I feel that the constraints of being part of the university, just even in terms of, I mean, I wish we had more laboratory learning environments where we could be with folks from cinema and the business school and the turkey. And I, whenever I talk to our colleagues, they want to do it too. And I know we do a certain amount of it, but what would you say where the keys are the keys at MIT and Stanford in terms, I mean, I know Stanford has this design school where there's- No, no, I know. But let me tell you what I think, which is, you know, in the areas they are very good at engineering, the technologies enabled them to do things 40, 50 years ago, especially the advent of computers. Remember, it's not surprising that both Stanford and MIT, they really started taking off in this way when computers showed up. They were doing things before for, you know, MIT has Lincoln Labs, and, and they did things for the government, but those weren't entrepreneurial projects. Those were big, projects, the entrepreneurial stuff 
came later because the technology was there. This is very important because I'm assuming that the cinema school has been revolutionized by the technologies that lets the students do their own production, editing, and things like that without huge studios. Am I correct that they must be doing yeah, I mean, but they still yeah, think of it yeah. as just a training way so they can get a job in a big studio, yeah. which is the unfortunate the thing. The they have not really yet good. grasped the fact that maybe the big studio, it's like you're talking about the financial no, no, companies in New York. I We're understand. all assuming that Warner Brothers will be here forever and will dominate the world forever. No, I and they're always to thinking maybe I, But I, I, let's get back to that in a second, because I think that the technologies that are enabling this new kind of communication and journalism are so new that I think the reason it hasn't happened before is we didn't have the tools. Or it may have taken two years of work. Well, two years of work and a lot of money is very different than you know some graduate students with some <coughs> research assistants go in a corner and start building stuff and in a month they show you a prototype. That's all very new. Remember Web 2.0, all these things, virtual worlds, it's very new. So there is something that's happening now that couldn't have happened before because we didn't have the technologies and now we have them. Let me, let me interrupt here and, and push this a little bit. Suppose you were put in the unfortunate position of being the associate dean of the Annenberg School for Communication and <laughs> Journalism, and your charge was to invent this space that would have incentives and, and, and resources. What would that space look like? I think it would be urging, for example, the people who tell me they're good, they're good ideas let's build a prototype. And if they say, God, you know, I'm a journalist, I don't know how to program or, or whatever, I say, okay, so let's hire, let, let, let's get funds to hire the right assistants, you know, the right technical people, which everybody here has told me, LA is full of those people, you know, who know how to build websites, know how to build visual, I mean, like, the, let's take the journalism thing. What would it take to build a prototype of that? I have a couple of ways we can go. I mean, I, I'm already working on building with Sandy Tolan's class. We're in the middle of letting the student reporting, and we're going to continue discussion on how we can build. But I ideally would like, I mean, I can get into the, quite a bit of detail. I don't know if this is the appropriate form, but I have some ideas on how we can move forward with prototypes on several different platforms to start examining best practices and thinking about which ones work. So looking at both working with Mel Slater's lab in London and Barcelona, where they're very keen to work with us, and they have also the building tools, but they don't have the content, and we have the content. Yeah. And so taking a simple thing as Second Life, inexpensive, first place to start, we do some things there to start no, but that's build, exactly and the, then going on right. to other platforms that are more so, expensive but also very powerful. So I think it's more almost building a center that they build things. It's almost like you're building a design studio. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I, I think mm -hmm. a lot of car companies have design studios in California. I don't mm -hmm. know if they are in LA or if they are yeah. further yeah. south. Yeah. 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 Further yeah. south? Further or, Orange County. Orange County. Really? Mm -hmm. Well, and in Thousand Oaks, BMW <coughs> design works as Thousand well, but Oaks. And in Torrance. Yeah. So, so you're in the LA area. Yeah. 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 So, so there's something in, in the neighborhood. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So <laughs> what we're talking about is a design. It, it feels like a. And am I correct? By definition, in a design studio, you design things. Yeah. No, no. But you don't just draw. You you, you, build. you, you draw build. build. You build it, right? Yeah. And you build it first virtually. So I think maybe it's sort of what does it mean to have the Annenberg Design Studio? Mm -hmm. And and it may be almost pattern it after media, what, is the media I mean is that sort of media lab? Well media lab, yeah, media lab that's what the media lab more or less is. 
Uh, I mean, Media Lab, it, it, you know, because of MIT's engineering stuff, it's a little more gadget oriented. And I, don't, I mean that in a very positive way. They will, I mean, robots. And they will, that's right. They will build robots. Robot. And I don't think you guys need to build robots. <laughs> but, uh, and you know, they will build things that you wear to sense yeah. when you're mm -hmm. getting very nervous, which is very important not for <coughs> you as a person, but let's say people who have autism sort of anticipate when something is getting them very upset and transmit that <coughs> signal to the people they are with so that they can start calming them down. So they, they are very technology, but the, I think they are less designed, whereas what you need to do, I mean, if you're going to do the journal stuff, just the technology is not interesting. You need the design experience. So you really want design people, but I suspect that's what you have in LA. I mean, all these people making movies, mm -hmm. they're trying to create an experience. Let me ask or this. gameplay. Isn't this a center for gameplay? It play? is, yes. absolutely. Yes. And we have people on the faculty who are doing We're also having a very interesting set of discussions, as I mentioned earlier, with uh, the company IDEO. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And what we're hoping is that they'll come in and... Uh, but I think I, part of what I hear you saying is that uh, we've reached the... Here at the Annenberg School, we've reached the edge of the box. Yeah, that's what it feels and, like. And uh, we, we think, you know, we're sort of scurrying outside occasionally to look outside and see what outside the box looks like. But you're saying um, that we need to do more of that across multiple dimensions, including some areas that would be a stretch in the area of design, production, and so on. But let me ask Jeff Cowan, who has been thinking about these things in terms of business models and organizational approaches. So. Well, I think what I hear you talking about, thank you, Ernie, is in a way software more than hardware. Totally. And so the difference between so Media software. Lab is it's a little bit more hardware. That's right. This is more software. That's right. And that's more what Los Angeles is anyway. It's more what our people are. I, and I just want to add one. There is no hard. And the things we're talking about. The technology exists. Oh, yeah. The, and now we can do it. Just one other point. I think, you know, you're raising the question of the film school. It was very interesting to me. My son is a filmmaker who just made a terrific scene in, in uh, John Aaron's yeah. scene in Korea for $5,000 because he did it from, he was in Encino when he did it. Because technology makes things possible. But the film studios don't necessarily want to see that done. Because they are in the business of owning yeah, the no, product that goes, no, but I'm just saying. I, I hear you, I hear you, but I, let me tell you, when I hear that, but let me just tell you what I hear yeah. when I do that, when I hear that. Because this is very important, and it's why I don't feel I don't shed any tears for this too for the uh, because if you ask me, gee, were we delighted in IBM when these microprocessors that almost killed us came up? The answer is, oh no, I mean it was terrible. And you say, well, but if it was terrible, why did you let that happen? They said, what What do you mean? Why did we let it happen? Well, this is the point that I, the point that I was going to make was that that that. Ernie says I've been spending some time thinking about leadership in the communications field, and one of the things that I found out a year working on um, uh, whatever happened to the powers that be, how they became the powers that were, and the way that happened was that they didn't want this innovation. They blocked it. Bill Paley's lab, he closed, and or CBS closed it, and when uh, Maverick Inventor, you know Peter Goldmark's book, I'm sure, when he came up with innovations, that would have given them the cassette recorder, for example, he saw as a threat to what they were be doing instead of realizing Phillips was going to do it anyway. So I think the notion here is that we have to be willing, and I think this certainly is where you're going, to break through and not worry about what the old corporations think and to find the thing that's going to happen someplace, and we got to be the place that's no, going that's to be right. the innovation. So, and, and, also, and, and this gets back to the equivalent yeah. of go meet the barbarians. Yeah. 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 Right. I mean, I'm assuming LA is full of Barbarian. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally. totally. It, it's like it's like the music business. I mean, I come out of the music business originally, and and the music business resisted the digital revolution so hard that it is as close to killing the business. It's like your IBM near death experience. 
And it's only now that they're beginning to think, well, maybe there's some way that we can use this digital revolution to actually help us revive the business. I'm going to uh, ask, ask Roberto and then Imre, but also we have our own barbarian. I mean, I don't want to accuse the journalism schools and communication schools of being hotbeds of innovation over the past decade or so. Uh, and I think we can look, you know, all the schools, engineering schools, business schools, and so forth, are also confronted with how do we train people to want to go meet the barbarians, to want to sit in these new kinds of, of environments that will be uncomfortable for the teachers, probably a little bit more comfortable for the students. But those kids must be in high school. No. In other words, right. the same kids that go to Stanford and MIT that the high schools must be full of kids that want to reinvent the media industry, yes. communications. Yes. And maybe it's almost, it's almost hang a shingle yes. saying, come here, we're come here. here yeah. that we're, I'm very serious that yeah. they must be there. Right. They must be there. I have a very quick comment. You know, the design studio is a great idea for the early prototyping. But there is another, you talked about changing the innovation culture, and I think there's a bigger fundamental issue about who are considered the role models in the university setting. So when you go to a Stanford, an engineering student doesn't necessarily want to become as smart as the professor, they want to become the next Sergio Brin, or, you know, or they want to be TJ Rogers, or, you know, but those are the role models, right. and the boundaries between those role That's models right. and the university are much more, uh, 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 they permeate much more effectively. Right. Whereas USC, even though it's talked about as an entrepreneurial university, doesn't have an entrepreneurial culture around it in terms of but, but it, it could be we may be talking about Silicon Valley in the 1970s not in 2010 <coughs> which is you may yeah. need to right. define right. what it means to mm -hmm. be entrepreneurial mm -hmm. in your industry yeah. don't mm -hmm. not in classic engineering mm -hmm. but in communications and media and you know and immersing yourself in in the news, and and there are no role models. But now there may not be role models. There have to be individuals with money who would want yeah. to yeah. have, you know, yeah. to be associated with you guys. Yeah. The, the, the yeah. challenge. Yeah, I'm gonna let, let's yeah, have two. Right on that, yeah. that that point you just raised, um, and go back to this idea of the Amber Design Studio, which. Can date the, the time of its birth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, um, this place is full of people who are ready to take on the barbarians. And the students, there are lots of them who are ready. To, they, they, will, they, will, they will attack. They, they're sheer, they, they've got the spears and swords that are ready to go. That's not the problem. And they've got lots of ideas um, if, they're, if they're encouraged to produce them. This this idea of a studio is, would seem to be a place where you could take those ideas and get them at least almost to the stage of a prototype, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or, or even a mock-up before a prototype. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm interested in, sort of in, in getting you to talk about the steps, the next step from there. Uh, I mean, you emphasize engaging with people with money going to market, uh, and there seems to be, a, there's, that's, you know, it's difficult in a lot of ways in the world we live in right now, and it's certainly difficult in the journalism business because of the way it's, it's viewed. But let's start from, we, we've got the, the, uh, the saints here who will take on the barbarians. They produce ideas. We give them the facilities to develop prototypes. What, hap what happens after you've got the thing that exists only on a screen here in the basement? Uh, but looks intriguing, looks possible. But well, looks yeah, let, let me just ask, Emory, did you have a, a, were you raising your hand earlier? Yeah, I did. Okay, why don't you ask a question now, because we've got to be out by uh, one third. We promised that we would be out by one third. So yeah. ask a quick question, okay. and then we'll ask Irving to respond to both of those. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. okay Irving. So um, my take on the of Gerstner's turnaround of IBM was that part, part, of, part of what he did was he, he made some tough decisions on 
pulling the plug on OS2, which was very painful, turning his back on the PC, really even turning his back on the PC. No, he didn't turn his back on the PC. But he, uh, IBM that, got out of the PC. But that came much PC. later. That, that happened with Sam Palmisano only a few years ago. I'm just correcting history. Lou didn't do that. Okay. He did stop OS2, although OS2 was Stop. Dead already. Yeah. <laughs> he just. But IBM putting resources into it. Oh no no IBM because a lot of people didn't want to accept the right. death. Right. But he just. Sure. Yeah, I'm sorry. But in any, in any case. Yeah yeah. I apologize for my ignorance. No no no, it's not ignorance. But, um, my, uh, my point is that in, in at the university we seem to be very good at adding new programs, adding new centers and initiatives but um, not so good at um, cutting back on them, deciding strategically, we're not going to pursue this anymore, we're gonna cut this, free up these resources, and put them into the design studio. No, I understand. So, Let me tell you, nobody's good at that. Nobody, in, <laughs> no, 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 whether you're in business, or, you know, people who say you have to learn to eat your own children don't have children. <laughs> no, no, seriously, it, every organization will tell you the same thing. And it's just very difficult. And at some point, that's the toughest part in management, especially in today's times when nobody has enough money is to prioritize. And prioritization is very, very painful. Can you help us with yes. Roberto's question? So let me. Th I'm going to ask you to do this in three minutes because then I will. I will do that. Thank all of you for. Three, I will do that. Three minutes. Thank you. I, what I would do if you had the design studio is publicize the hell out of it. Get New York Times to come, LA you know, Times, anybody, Wire Magazine. Let everybody know what incredible stuff you're doing here. So you have to do massive marketing and communications. And then, then I would say you have to invite different companies, uh, VCs. You just have to have a really concerted plan of, let me use the term, merchandising. Now, I know in a lot of universities, <coughs> that sounds like opening a whorehouse. <laughs> but, but I don't mean that. We're getting over that. Uh, because, you know, that's what MIT and Stanford, why do you think Stanford gets so much in the papers? You know, they have people doing that. In IBM, and I hope you can meet Johnny Wada, boy, do we do publicity. And, and you know, we get a mock-up of this bottle of water and we're saying, this is the best thing since bottled water. <laughs> and so you need to do that. And that will make everybody feel better. And by the way, that kind of, I don't know if Cookspace is the right term. Again, at MIT, Harvard, whatever, they just do that naturally, probably because by now they feel right. it's like toi de senor. You know, that's right. just what we do. <laughs> and. You have to get out there, and, and then that will attract people. But the merchandising, the, when, Lou, when Lou appointed me head of the internet division, uh, <clears throat> one of the things, I remember we had a breakfast meeting together. I remember well because it was December and it was snowing a lot, and he and I were <clears throat> like the only people around. And he said that, you know, Irving, you have to do a lot within the company, but because of what we're doing, you have to spend a lot of time outside. You have to spend a lot of time with communications, with press, and let our own people inside read about the strategy from what people write, wow. because they'll believe it more mm -hmm. when they see it in the New York Times. That's he he was, was totally well, it right. Was Maybe we could take <coughs> north to the end of our design studio this summer. We can think about it. I hereby commit <laughs> with the plenipotentiary power under my Dois de Seigneur, Dois de Professeur, that uh, we will do this and we will um, uh, call it the Irving Ladowski Burger Honorary. <laughs> <laughs> so let, let's thank Irving.